Okay, cool. So then, uh, data science seminar series, we invited uh, Dr. Xiaogong Ma or Marshall Ma from the uh, University of I I I I I I sorry. So Marshall Ma is an associate professor of computer science and the dean's distinguished fellow at the uh, University of Idaho. He received his PhD in Earth Systems Science and Geoscience from the University of Frankfurt, Netherlands. And then he completed his postdoc training in data science at RBI. So his research um, mainly focuses on deploying data science within the semantic web to support cross-disciplinary collaboration and scientific discovery. So Dr. Ma has um, received several prestigious, prestigious awards, including the Science of T Science Meritorious Contribution Award, the IEMG Research Award, and the inaugural ICSU WTS Data Stewardship Award. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Ma to present his talk on machine-readable semantics in data science for geosciences. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Sean, for the introduction, and thanks a lot to IES for the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to talk, uh, it's more like an empirical introduction of a lot of previous research projects and then our thoughts and ideas based on those experience. I will not show any details about algorithms or uh, data science methods, but uh, just like more focus on the story and uh, the interesting part of the stories. Yeah, I will call three parts. Uh, I will begin like a dessert. Uh, I will first show you two stories from our uh, previous collaboration. Introduce a number of concepts, uh, seven infrastructure, data, data science, semantic web, and uh, knowledge graph. And then in the middle, I will show a number of uh, examples. So basically, for people in geoscience, not only in the United States, but globally, how people are using semantics for the steps in the data science workflow, different steps, data collection, data cleansing, exploratory data analysis, machine learning, visualization, all those steps. How can semantics help improve the quality of research in those steps? And then the third part, I will give more details about um, one of our recent research projects called uh, OpenMinDAT, how we open a really large database in the field of mineralogy called mean that some work on the semantics, knowledge graph, and then the open data efforts. Here is one of my first two um, data science stories I'm gonna share. It's relatively old. So when I was uh, preparing the slides, when I look at, oh, it's almost 10 years, almost, you can only, can't imagine. So the leader of this work, uh, is uh, Greta Hestan. Actually, I just met her three days ago at the DC. Um, when she did this work, she was a postdoc at the University of Arizona. She actually is in the field of mathematics. But uh, later you can see this work is mineral informatics, how we use data science to study mineral species. But now she is an associate professor at uh, Purdue University in Northwest. You can see the data source we use is uh, mean that. And there's three types of data set in the database or in this study, mineral species. There are about 5,000 mineral species at that time, 2014. And then the second type is the localities. And that time is a little bit more than, I think, 100,000 distinct localities. Locality means locations on the surface of the earth where this mineral species has been discovered. And then there are a little bit more than uh, half a million observations. Each observation actually is just like a species locality pair. So if this species was discovered in this locality, we call it an observation. So you can see the data structure is very simple, right? Actually, there are only two types of data set. And then the last one is just like a derived report from, from species and the, and the localities. But Grad, she's a mathematician. So using the R environment, she discovered a really interesting pattern. 
in the middle observation records. It's called the large number of real events. This mathematical model or statistical model actually is um, originally is from the, the field of linguistics. Uh, but here, let me explain what is large number of real events. In mino species, some of them, they are very popular, like diamond or quartz, they are very popular. They are discovered almost everywhere, thousands of locations, or tens of thousands of locations. But many other mineral species, they are very rare. So you can see here in this um, background, for more than 1,000 species, they are discovered in just one locality. And then about 600 of them, they are discovered in two locations. And then about 400 is discovered only in three locations. Actually, among that 5,000 mineral species, more than half of them, they were discovered in less than five localities. So you can see they are very rare, but the population is very high. That's why mathematicians call this pattern as large number of rare events. And then Greta did a really great job. She saw this pattern. And then in the R environment, she was able to use a model, exactly the RNI model, to match the observation. So here, there's uh, those bars in the light color, they are from the real observation. And then those bars in the dark blue color, they are simulated by the model. So you can see it's a really good match. But once we get this model, once we get these parameters in this model and uh, simulate it, we are able to do a lot of interesting uh, study. And one work Garada did is um, the prediction of potential mineral species. So how to understand that? It's like an extrapolation. Uh, here the curve, especially this curve. Uh, let me show you. On the horizontal bar is the number of, number of observations. Like here, this dash line, if you see the joint point in here is um, 652,000, that's the current number of observations. So here, by using the LNIE model, we match from this diagram, we can do an extrapolation getting this curve. And now the interesting thing is that if we have two and a half million observations, then you can see in here, and then you look at uh, the vertical bar. The vertical bar is a number of uh, species. And here is the current number of uh, mineral species, as you see over there, 4,800 something, right? But now assume we have two and a half million observations, and then you can get another joint point in here, and then the difference between those two points. Sorry, I got confused. Do you mean the observation for each location is this? Uh, it's total, uh, total observations globally. Each location only have one observation. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, they can be multiple observations at a single locality. Oh, I see. Because like um, one species, they may be discovered in several locations. And then each location, you may be able to find a lot of uh, mineral species. Oh, so this is observation of what? Observation of mineral species. Oh, I see. Observation of mineral species. Is there a formula for the LNRE model? Is there yes, a there's a formula. formula. There's a formula. Actually, you can see the two bars in the dark blue color, they are from the formula. They are, mm -hmm. they are from the formula. Mm -hmm. And the coding language is um, in uh, the R, is in the R environment. I think Greta actually shared the code in her paper. So if you maybe just search the other uh, past that 2015 RNI, you can find the paper and even the, the shared R code about this study. Is this this uh, algorithm has a training stage and then a prediction? Yes, the yeah. training stage. So actually here, when you see this, uh, why I put uh, those bars in two different colors together, this is the training stage. Mm -hmm. and like, you can see it's a really good match, right? The, those light green bars, they are the actual data set. And those uh, dark blue bars, they are from the mathematical formula. Mm -hmm. But for sure, in our environment, you, you can use many other metrics to evaluate the quality of, uh, of the match or the training result.
And here you can see the result is very impressive. Using LOI, we are able to predict there are about 1,400 new mean species to be discovered if the population can reach a certain amount. And then for mineralogists, they are able to extend the study by adding more mineralogical meanings. Like for example, we can look at the mineral species of different elements, like carbon. We only look at the carbon minerals. It's the same in a protein. People can even use some combination, include, exclude those kind of conditions to see mineral species of certain types. Like here, we can also look at the carbon plus oxygen minerals. We can look at uh, carbon minerals without sodium and many other kind of uh, combinations. They all have the same pattern. And we can use this to predict how many mineral species to be discovered for those different types. Seems like in the middle, there are some uh, predictions not accurate and there is a great variation. Yes. So that's so, in broad C. Yeah, this one is just based on the numbers. And there are a lot of interesting discussions. Actually, later I will show you. Mm -hmm. You can see this study was done almost 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? The data, um, after 10 years, we already have accumulated, accumulated a lot of other reports. Mm -hmm. So actually, just a few days ago in, the, in, a, in another data zone, we had some kind of discussion to see now it's time to review this study. For here, for this model, it's just statistics. Just based on numbers. And then the second uh, story I'm going to share with you is again using a uh, recourse from MINDAT, but it's slightly different. The first one is amino ecology, distribution frequency of amino species. This one is uh, focused on amino evolution. We add age into amino species. And here the topic is on cobalt minerals. Why cobalt minerals? Because um, I think cobalt is very important. It's based on my learning and discussing with uh, uh, those experts. Uh, I have totally no training experience in biology, but they have. And they told me cobalt is important because cobalt is uh, the metal center for vitamin B12. It's called uh, cobalamin or just vitamin B12, and it's very important in many uh, organisms. So that's why they choose some um, cobalt minerals as uh, the research topic. And then another advantage of this is um, even now, there's only a total of uh, 66 cobalt mineral species globally. But for sure, each of them has a different age. Here, the age is all focuses the first appearance of that mineral species on Earth. And then using that, we can draw those uh, diagrams. We call them bipartite network. It's between two different types of nodes, elements and the mineral species. And then because for each mineral species, now we have the age, the first appearance on Earth, we can actually draw a diagram, actually, Anil and uh, Eli, they draw a diagram. Actually, you can see on the top, the numbers are changing. Just <laughs> the unit of uh, the number here is a uh, million years ago. Million years ago. So that's why you see it's decreasing from 4.6 billion years ago coming to present. And then you can see for many years, the network did not change. And then at a certain time, there's like an explosion of uh, cobalt minerals. And you can see a sudden enlargement in this network. It's about seven minutes, the whole animation. So I need to quickly uh, go forward. Um, but based on Eli and uh, Arnold's research, they said this work is very important because it can show the biological functions of cobalt. And also from the other perspective, they can also show how some chemical and uh, geological factors, they have influenced the, the utilization of cobalt in the early evolution of life. This is like- It's a time evolving network. Yeah, so yeah, it's a time series. 
Okay. Uh, this related to the uh, large uh, large number rare events. This one is different. Oh. Okay. This one is a different study. Okay. So the large number of uh, large number of rare events pattern is about the distribution, but here is about the evolution. It's a time series. Oh. So with the time series, if you freeze one time point, it still can have the large number of rare events, the distribution rate. Right? We can we can think about that, okay. but uh, just that actually is a, is a good reminder. It is really hard right. to get the age of mineral species because conventionally in the field of geology and the mineralogy, people don't care about the age, like the first appearance of a certain mineral species on Earth. Mm -hmm. But just recently, people begin to uh, think about that. Okay. That's why they proposed the, the new research field called mineral evolution. Okay, thank you. So I showed you two interesting stories, but actually we have a lot. We have a lot of others. Uh, you can see here, there are some database and programs, deep time digital earth, 4D, deep time data driven discovery, and a lot of other databases, including MINDAT. So based on our work almost in the past two decades, like for me, I studied as a PhD student, postdoc, assistant professor, uh, not an associate professor. So based on our work in the field of geoinformatics, we have some source. Can be a kind of hypothesis. If I call them hypothesis, is data set, good data set, together with good facilities of computing, good algorithms, we have the potential to change the nature of scientific discovery. Uh, sometimes we call it a data driven geoscience, sometimes we call it a data intensive geoscience. And then for my small research focus, I would say we need good ways to integrate data set into semantically cohesive data platforms. So what is semantics and how to integrate data sets using semantics? I will show you a number of examples. Um, here again is some uh, definition of concepts. Um, this is a diagram provided by um, NSF and you can see um, they call this as a cyber infrastructure ecosystem. But here you can see data is absolutely the essential foundation of uh, the cyber infrastructure ecosystem. And in our work, we address the importance of semantics for data. And what is exactly semantics? Semantics means meanings. But when we look back at the data, in my own understanding, I always like to say, Data is the structure representation of facts. And then to make it really useful, we need uh, structures, we need a machine readability in data set. And that's why we take knowledge graph as a research focus. In very simple words, each knowledge graph is um, the representation of concepts and the relationships in a domain. And then in the real world practice, Knowledge graph can show up in different formats like vocabulary, ontology, and uh, uh, logic assertions. And then put this into practice. Uh, here are two summaries of the work we've done recently. We see we can use semantics to collect steps and uh, smooth workflow in the data science process. And uh, very recently, we're also trying to, we call them incorporation or infusing, infusing knowledge graph in statistics and in machine learning for studying complex systems. Can you please go back to the last slide, page eight? Oh, this one, yeah. how the semantic get involved in this structure? I will show you in the next diagram, actually. Oh, <laughs> First slide, I want to show you this diagram and the next diagram will answer your question. Um, here's just a quick overview of uh, a number of those um, um, different forms of, you call them knowledge graphs, it's fine. Ontologies is also fine. Like on the very left, a catalog, a glossary, it's just like an alphabetical list of concepts in the domain. Taxonomy, kind of hierarchical structure, conceptual schema, 
make it more serious, like a sugar class, subclass. And uh, on the far right, we call this as very serious semantics. Like using some certain language, RDF, Resource Description Framework, or Web Ontology Language. We can do a lot of interesting assertions, like two disjoint subclasses, transitive properties, or symmetric properties. But then, how can this be used in the research of geoscience? Now I answer your question. So how can semantics be used either in the cyber infrastructure ecosystem or more specifically, I can even use a so-called data science workflow to show you some examples. I think this one is very popular either in mathematics, <laughs> statistics, or in any other research field using data or data science in research, from data collection, pre-processing, exploratory analysis, some machine learning, or data mining. Finally, you get some results, visualization, and then communicative results. I will use um, five examples to show you how machine readable semantics, or just like vocabularies, ontologies, knowledge graphs, can be used in those steps. Actually, when I look through those examples, many of them, they are used not only in one step, but uh, probably in my, in my regard, the highlight of many work is more related to a certain step in the, in the data science workflow. That's why I just link them to one or two steps. Let's begin with uh, schema.org. All these pictures are with the semantics, right? This is uh, like a uh, schema, NE, uh, GEOBIA, and um, Medclip, and uh, Global Change, all these are uh, semantics. They all have done some work on semantics. Oh, I see. So the first is uh, schema.org. This is an initiative proposed by Google, Yahoo, Bing, and originally also include the uh, index. You see they are search engines. And then at that time, they are very ambitious. They said, OK, we now have so many websites, so many web pages. We want to add a meaning into the description of those web pages. So they propose schema.org as a huge metadata schema. They have a long list of objects and then the metadata item, including um, a metadata schema for data set. Here you can see many um, open data portals, like data one, NASA's data portal, USGS data portal, they all use the metadata schema provided by schema.org to allocate the page. And then the metadata can be harvested by the search engine. Like Google is always indexed to set pages because now it's structured. They can easily find, oh, this page uses schema.org metadata index um, the data set. In other way, they can easily harvest metadata for millions of data sets from thousands or tens of thousands of, of websites. They can clean the record, make a huge database, just like the search engine do for any other resources. But here the focus is data set, <coughs> so they are able to make a data set search engine. So now on this search engine, you can see, I don't know how many records, tens of millions or some billions of data set records, but the mechanism behind it is the schema.org because the search engine they provide structure metadata description and then all those data portals they're able to use it. What kind of data set can be said as a metadata? It's data about data. Data about the data. Oh, it's like a summarized data. Yeah, like like a description. Oh, I see. Like on this photo. Okay, this one is not a good example. <laughs> okay. Like like for each photo, we look at the label. You can see ingredients, nutrition facts, okay. manufacturer address, oh, and the metadata. Okay. And the data set actually, we look at. If you take this as an example of data, the water in it is the data set. Mm -hmm. Right? And then the description on the label. Okay. These are the metadata. Okay, thank you. Okay. My second example is um, how semantics are used in data pre processing, convincing, and the exploration. I use an example from Europe. 
This one actually is old, but it's still very interesting. It's in the field of uh, geological maps. It's a really ambitious research project for geological map sharing started in 2007. But then in 2010, for people in Europe, they started like a more focused um, work because in Europe is different from the United States. They have different language. And then each nation, when they share the national geological map, for example, in the one to one million scale, normally the official language you see on the map is their official language. France, French, Germany, German, Netherlands, Dutch. You can see it's a very challenging job. So one work they have done is to develop multilingual vocabularies. But geology is a big research field. So for this study, they have three years. They focus on two subjects, age and the rock types. And then they use uh, semantic web technologies to do the encoding of the vocabulary. And then they use the vocabulary as a middleware between a final portal, like here. On this portal, what you see is like a geological map of Europe. But actually, the map layers you see here for each nation, they are based in a server of another country, of another country's geological survey. And then those multilingual vocabularies that are used as the middleware to translate the queries from English or from another language into the original language, get the result back, and then show them on the, on the, on the front end. It's a complicated process, but it works. And one interesting um, functionality here is the so-called uh, federated query. Like here on the portal, you can select, say, I want to see all the polygons or the spatial features within the scope of uh, Sinozoic. And then this portal actually also provides you the possibility to select not only Sinozoic as a label, but also all the sub concepts of uh, Sinozoic. You can even select just show all the polygons in one single column. Like, like here, the diagram on the, on, on the right, you can see Sinozoic actually is it's a very high level concept. We had a lot of sub concepts. So you do have the portal did give you the possibility to make the selections and then retrieve the result you want. Uh, this example is more complicated. It's not only about uh, just like some games with the data set, it's more serious uh, machine learning in the field of uh, remote sensing image processing. Um, some of you may have used or even work directly on, now there's a really popular method called a semantic segmentation in image processing. Very popular now, but if you look at this one, this one again was published, first published about 10 years ago. People call it uh, object-based image analysis or more related to uh, geography or geology, people call it a geo-BIA. But then the diagram on the left, you can see it's like an iterative process. First, impose domain-specific knowledge, expert knowledge into an ontology, and then take out like a subset into a rule set apply it to the image object hierarchy, and then get a more understanding, enrich the knowledge. You can also enrich your ontology. It's like an iterative process. This is very popular, and I think this also has a very strong relationship to the semantic segmentation in all this. And then the ontology for sure. Some people just write it as a very simple hierarchy structure, just using Excel. It's also fine, but some other people, they also use uh, RDF, resource description framework for the encoding of the ontology and uh, the rule set in their work. What you mean is object-based image of that? What, why is object-based? Very simple. So the slogan of people in this research field is transfer all focus from pixel to objects. So originally images, they're pixels, uh -huh. right? But then object means you treat an image not only like pixel by pixel. People begin to treat like 
the patterns in this image. Like here, this is a forest. This part is farmland. They give meaning to the polygons okay. in the image. Okay. So it means high. Okay. And then we move on along the data science workflow. This one is uh, focused on the documentation of uh, scientific workflows. It's like a part of the result demonstration or result communication. It's a work done by a group of scientists in Spain, the University of uh, Canterbury. It's really interesting. Their research field is climate change. And then the work they have done is they use a ontology called a frog lens, frog lens documentation. Uh, they develop an ontology and then they develop an R package to document the problems of workflows in the R environment. It's something really interesting. So what they do is they still use the R environments, write code and then run the workflow. Just one additional work they did is using their package, they are able to document the problems, like the details of each step in their original workflow. And they can write it in a open source uh, language, JSON LD, JSON linker data. And then they can append the problems in the resulting image of the original workflow. This is a really tricky part. It's like in the original workflow, the output is an image, like here some climate change research results. And then their work is able to document the problems in JSON LD, append the JSON LD somewhere secretly inside the piece of JPEG format or PNG format. And then they build a portal. So if you have such an image with the problems information inside it, you just drag and drop the image to the portal. You can see a visualized graph. And this graph is interactive. So whenever you do like a mouse over or click on the load, you are able to see the detailed information. Like here is this uh, like a filtering step or a data set step or an algorithm running step. You can see all the details. Uh, some time ago, I also discussed this work with some um, people in the field of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. They said, ah, you know, there's, there's so many generative models. Like we even don't know which piece of text, which image is generated by machine. And then again, all those generated content, it can be used as a training data set in the model. So finally, we may even don't know what is the source of something generated by AI. And then I show them maybe we can apply this approach. Like for any results in the digital world, we need to show the problems. What is the source and what is the workflow used to generate it? And the last example I want to show you in the semantics for data science workflow is I think it's using semantics for scientific communication. This is the work I did when I was a postdoc at Rensselaer Polytechnic. It's uh, for the US GCRP, Global Change Research Program. At that time, it was uh, the third national climate assessment. I don't know among the audience or people on Zoom if uh, some of you are working in the field of environmental science or related to climate change. You may have heard just last week, USGCRP released the NCA5, the fifth report of uh, national climate assessment. But at that time, back to 2012, the work was on the third national climate assessment. You can see it's a huge report how huge it is. When I was a postdoc working on this project, the PI joke with me is, he said, okay, for USGCRP, every year, the budget was about 2.5 billion US dollars. For four or five years, USGCRP will release an NCA report, is about 1,000 pages. So five years, 2.5 billion every year. <laughs> Now 1,000 pages. So each page represents more than 10 million federal investment in research. The money is one thing, but then on the other side, you can think how heavy 
the research result is. So it represents a lot of work. And then for NCA3, our collaborator at the USG side they said they want to release not only the report as a document, they also want to release the workflow, including the data sources, algorithms, instruments, and also um, the workflow used to generate a result. So that's why you can see it's from transparency to reproducibility. And our work is uh, developing a model. We call it ontology for the data port. The data port is called a glo uh, global change information system. And our ontology is called a GCIS ontology. And GCIS is released. You can see the domain name is here, data.globalchange.gov. It's still in use. Uh, last week, when I had on um, my social media, NCA5 is released. I went to this portal. I can see uh, it's still in use, and I can see the documented resources, everything, process, tools for NCA5 is also documented and released on this portal. So I'm very happy. So <laughs> it's a work in my in my postdoc time, but now it's still in use. And then for the documented uh, provenance of NCA, we can do a lot of interesting mining. Uh, this diagram is a good representation. It's like on the top, you just see a piece of report or paper, but actually below it or behind it, you can see a lot of resources supporting the scientific discovery. And once all those are documented, we can do a lot of interesting uh, mining or information search, like we can ask show me all the NASA contributions to the sea level rise figures in this report. Which agencies have people, like if I want to find some collaborators, I can see which agencies have people working on the social uh, in, uh, societal impacts of extreme weather events. We can run queries into the documented problems and find the necessary information. Well, that's my second part. I show you how semantics can be used in a scientific workflow. But the last part is the most recent work we are doing on um, opening up the mean that database. It's a huge database. In all words, we call it uh, the largest, not one of the largest, it's the largest. It's the largest database for mineral species and the distribution across the world. Uh, here is a quick short statistics. In last year, uh, the database has about uh, 27 TV data set, a lot of web pages, and the web traffic is also very high. In a single year, there was about uh, 65 million page views from around 10 million unique users. And then about 40% of the traffic was from the United States. And then, but most importantly, we have a large number of people contributing records to the database. And then because it's crowdsourcing, we also have a large team of uh, mineralogical experts. Many of them, they are like retired uh, professors from universities or research scientists in museums. They spend a lot of time helping, helping us reviewing and cleansing the records before the records are released on the, on, on, on the front end website. The whole website was created by Julian Ruff back to 2000. In 2000, he created this uh, database and website as uh, like a, his personal hobby. But uh, along the two decades, he's now involved into a really good online resource for the study of geology and the mineralogy. But it also faced ch challenges. So especially in the recent five or six years, many people send a request to Jolian Ruff saying, ah, we are interested, for example, we're interested in copper minerals, we're interested in carbon minerals. Are you able to share all the localities and then the observation of those records? There are a lot of requests sent to Julian, and very often what I can do is 
he need to do like a separate query to the database, download the data records, and share to uh, the requester. This is a very tedious job. So that's why um, in 2021, we applied a grant from NSF and uh, we begin to do an uh, open data portal. For me that, we for sure also applied some techniques and the workflows to clean up the records, make it uh, semantically compulsive before we share the records through the machine interface. Here you can see we've done a lot of work, like the fundamental stuff on space and time, some um, domain specific standards like a uh, middle name list, and uh, log types, log classification. We're also trying to leverage schema.org to allocate the web page. We're also trying to add persistent identifiers to the records on this database. And now, now we have an uh, API. This one meets the needs of a lot of geologists. I know, for example, Shuang, you probably have an interest to use the database, but originally you don't have a way to download a large number of records, but now with the API, you can easily just write a number of codes, you can easily get what you want. And besides this API, um, we are also developing an R and Python packages, uh, including some interesting functions to um, allow you to use the data subjects. And here you can see uh, like uh, middle species, their chemical composition and uh, localities, their coordinates, and also age as, uh, as the input parameters to query the API. Here is a very uh, simple example. Like uh, I believe for many, if anyone in the audience, you are in geology or mineralogy, you might be interested to try this function. So, just the one line of code, we can give you the whole list of for IMA approved mineral species list. IMA is at the International Mineralogical Association. I think this is the function requested by, I don't know how many people sent to Jordan Rock, hundreds or even thousands of people. But now we embed everything in just one function. And uh, another interesting panel, this is, the function and the API, um, they are linked to the database. We do have an open data server, but uh, the, the reports on the open data server, they are always synchronized with um, the main, data, main database. So it's always up to date. Uh, when I wrote this uh, slide, I think this was about uh, three weeks ago, we had about uh, 5,960 mineral species approved by IMA. But now, if you run the function, I believe you can get a 5,975. And for sure, we can do a lot of other interesting use cases to meet the needs, like using the combination of different elements to get a certain list of uh, mineral species. We are also collaborating with uh, a few other data portals, like those in the field of uh, petrology and the geochemistry. Because they, they have the need to get a, uh, like a list of rock types together with uh, synonyms from MINDAT. So now from the API, we are also able to download such list and share with uh, the other data portals for their data cleansing or data harmonization work. And here is, so if anyone is interested in machine learning, here's something for you. With all those clean reports, for sure we are able to do more statistical analysis and the machine learning work. And one work very recently was done by Sean Morrison and uh, Anirul Prabhu. They use association analysis to do, to study the patterns of uh, mineral co-occurrence across all the localities. And then they use the association rules or models they found from the training of the models. After that, once they get a model, they can do mineral occurrence predictions. Association analysis is probably popular in uh, e-commerce, like Amazon or some other platform. It's like this person 
many people uh, who bought A and B may also buy C. This is a so-called association analysis. And in their work is, they can train the machine to get the pattern of mean um, co-occurrence. And once the model is set up, now you give me a load, a new locality. And then there's a number of uh, mineral species already appeared in this location. And then using the model, we can predict how many other new mineral species may appear in this location. And then Julian Roth quickly adapt their results, simplify a little bit, but he applied it to almost all the 400,000 localities. I mean that. Yesterday, when I was preparing my slide, I actually took a, a locality from Texas. It's uh, the Hasperus County. I think this one is in the Western Texas. I, I found a lot of uh, localities uh, in other countries. I think there are several mining companies in other country. Uh, but on mineralogy, there are 113 friendly mineral species in this country. And based on this, for sure, we can use uh, the association analysis result to make predictions. Like here, you can see, this is just a part of the table, it's a really long table. You can see based on the existing 113 mineral species and also their chemical formula, um, we can predict which other new mineral species may appear or may be found at this locality and then the possibility based on the match. And then this is not the end of the story. We also incorporated another model developed by uh, uh, Dr. Bob Hazen at the Carnegie. It's called a uh, paragenetic mode. He, based on his understanding, uh, summarized a, lot, a total of about um, 57 paragenetic modes of mineral species. It's like the co-occurrence pattern of, uh, of uh, mineral species based on a lot of uh, geological and mineralogical backgrounds. And now for each locality, based on the existing mineral species, we can also assign points to those paragenetic modes. And here we can also show the result as a sorted list with those as high score on the top. So I think for people working on uh, mineral deposits or economic geology, they may have an interest to uh, look at this table and do more studies. But for us, we have scaled this up to all the localities I mean that. So for any locality web page, if you go there, you can see such two tables. Here's a quick summary about what I uh, presented. Um, those uh, uh, notes in light gray, they are about how to build knowledge graphs, how to leverage existing resources. And then those notes in dark gray color, they are about how to use, how to use the knowledge graph result in scientific workflows for data science or for scientific construction. And uh, we are currently uh, running two uh, international programs. I'm like a member in the data science work of, uh, of those two pro programs. The first one is called uh, 4D, initiated by Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, DC. The scientific focus is um, Earth, space, life. And then the work I presented for MINDAT actually is a part of this initiative. And the second program, again, I'm also a member for the data science work is uh, from the International Union of Geological Science or the Deep Time Digital Earth or DDE. Um, you can see actually on the, on the scientific part, it shares a lot of common topics with uh, 4D. And they both aim to be a long-term program until probably around 2029 or 2030. So we still have a lot of work to do, even focusing on semantics, data science, we still have a lot of work to do. So here's the even broad topic. 
semantics is not only about uh, the topics in data. We can make a broad thinking. We can also think about data and uh, hypothesis, link between data and algorithms, or even link between people and people. So that's why for the almost 80 years in the, in the, in the past 80 years, we have done a lot of those um, uh, initiatives, data songs, small workshops facing uh, young scientists. Actually, last week, we just organized a data song at um, Carnegie Institution in Washington, DC. Um, and for me, actually, when I was postdoc, I already joined a lot of those uh, activities. And now as a faculty, I begin to lead some of those um, some of those uh, data songs. So data science is not, is not only about semantics. For sure, semantics is very important as you show in this uh, list. They are the foundation of the fair open data. They can accelerate the data science workflow. But all after all, in my understanding, data science is done by people, especially young people. So we also need to remember that. Okay, I will. Ended here, and I will be happy to answer any comments or questions. <laughs>